You are listening to Invisible Not Broken, the chronic illness podcast that doesn't sugarcoat anything. I'm Eva Minkoff, your co-host, fibromyalgia warrior, and founder of Wellacopia. This episode is part two of my intimate interview with Stephanie Tate. In case you haven't listened to the first part of our chat, which I definitely encourage you to do, Stephanie is a disabled disability advocate with Lyme disease, amongst many other related complications. In the almost 15 years it took her to get a diagnosis, she struggled with miscarriages, medical indifference, and sexism. Thankfully, during that time, she also had her two beloved sons. Her recently published book, The View from Rock Bottom, is a tale of her struggles with chronic illness along with the messages about faith, pain, suffering, joy, and hope. In this continuation of our conversation, Tate discusses the importance of centering the chronically ill in discussions about necessary changes to the medical community and our healthcare system. As always, we want to remind you that all conversations and health claims on this podcast are based on individual experiences and expertise. Everyone has their own personal and professional truths and should be treated as such. Lastly, stay tuned at the end for a special announcement. Okay, let's get started. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. Well, you took us on a journey that, um, first of all, thank you for taking us on that journey. And what I couldn't help but think during all of it um, is how all of our journeys are, are obviously different and um, we all experience them um, differently. But at the same time, we all relate to what you're saying. And hmm. in, in, I mean, even myself and um, especially early on in the story, like that, that was my story. Uh, definitely. And it's, it's a cruel reality that everything that you said is not abnormal for us. No. It's, and the, the feeling for me, uh, not being recognized as being well, it, it being real, my experience being real, and then actually uh, insinuating that I'm lying. Mm -hmm. Like not even recognizing that it's not real, but then it, it goes back to, well, you must be crazy or making it up or lying. Like, um, and I also, you know, dancer, performer. I was a bit of a dramatic teenager, but it was unrelated because I liked yeah. being the, um, the I can do anything girl. Yeah. And that's what I tried to tell people around me. I was like, look, fibro is not like being fatigued and not being able to do things is not how I plan on getting attention. Not well, and that's such a gendered reaction, by the way, this oh, idea yeah. of like, women are so hysterical and so illogical that apparently they're also so stupid that they can't think of a better way <laughs> to get attention than to subject themselves to repeated painful medical tests, right? Like, what, what woman is like, you know, I haven't had attention from a man lately, so I'm going to let him jam a needle in my spine and do a spinal tap that I don't need because that just sounds like the best option for me to get attention. I can't think of a better plan than that. Let's do that. Like that doesn't even make sense. Right. But to think that women are just capable of that because we're so histrionic, that is the most chauvinistic, sexist piece of garbage. And yet we hear it from doctors all the time because you're right. This isn't unusual. This is what's so different about talking about these things with someone else who's in the chronic illness community is when you share this story outside to most able-bodied folks, they're like, wow, that's shocking. 15 years. Oh my gosh. And not one of them. I mean, you should sue somebody because that's just what a crazy, unusual story. And you tell this story to someone who's disabled or chronically ill. And they're like, yeah, I know like 12 people who had the same thing happen. I've had other people that are like 15 years, man, I know someone that spent 30 years, like that's nothing. Like I know someone that it's not unusual. This happens all the 
time, all the time. There wouldn't be people listening to this podcast or making no. all the in, in these groups and all these rallies. The, all of this exists because we are a um, a real population of people and a huge one. Mm -hmm. like if you actually do the math, it's about a hundred million people in America. That's that's a third of America, and that's by the way with these more quote unquote rare chronic illnesses, there's 157 million now um, with chronic illnesses overall, but I'm talking like autoimmune genetic, chronic pain, fibro related stuff, like a hundred million of us. There is a hundred million of us. This is not small. There's a reason why hashtag Spoonie, there's like 2 million hashtags being used of Spoonie, just Spoonie. Yeah. So you know, thanks to Spoon Theory. Um, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's so incredible that we're a population that's overlooked and underserved because it's such a large one in a westernized culture. It's not even like we're in, you know, India. That's, I, that's a weird thing to say, but you know what I mean? It's like- I understand are, what you mean. We are a people who have the ability to really speak out and, um, we have resources to make things known and insight that at least I know I have is um, I do know the medical community, both from holistic to very standard. Um, I say this all the time on the podcast. My husband is a pediatric gastroenterologist in fellowship. So he is in it. He is in the system. He doesn't even, other than obviously diagnoses, he doesn't get to really have anything to play with in terms of opinions and whatnot. He has to He's in boot camp. Yeah. And I love talking to him because I want to know what that's like. Mm -hmm. I want to know what it's like on the other side. And I talk to all of his and my doctor friends. Uh, and then I talk to the more holistically minded doctors. And I like seeing all the different perspectives and where is a common denominator. And then also where are all the issues and where can we like connect all of the dots. And I truly feel that relationships um, is the answer to that. Hmm. The problem being that we don't see eye to eye. So um, to put it blank, like be straightforward. And these are just examples. This isn't true for everyone. Um, so we are like, you're not listening to me. You don't believe me. And then from a doctor's perspective, nice or not, like I'm not talking about anything about their character, just from being a doctor. It's like, I'm not allowed to do anything if there hmm. isn't proof so it doesn't matter what I think. I'm not allowed to do this. Um, if I give you a hint that what you're saying is true, but I can't do anything, that puts me at risk with your health because I'm responsible. Yeah. Um, and there's legalities around that. Um, money, when it comes to tests, doctors are actually, this is what a lot of people don't know, doctors are discouraged to spend money and make you and spend money. It's, a lot of people think it's just a money-making machine. In many ways, it absolutely is. Do not get me wrong. Pharmaceuticals, good Lord. Um, <laughs> but they're actually supposed to bring down costs in the right ways. Um, I'm not saying it is right. Obviously, we have some major issues with tests. No, I get what you mean. Yeah. But, and then there's, so it's this, and then at the same time, doctors have to create some kind of a wall. They don't always know how to, what kind of wall to create in order to be able to deal with so many sick people all the time. Yeah. Husband, one of the most compassionate people, if not the most compassionate person I've ever met, who loves kids and is a pediatrician, um, you know, he's got to put something up where he's going to crack every day, every moment of every day. But what kind of a wall are they putting up? Hmm. And so I see that there needs to be um, more of a push for a human relationship. But just like other human relationships, you don't have to. I'm an empath, right? So like, you don't have to be an empath to the point where you're like, I just took all of that in. Like, right. you can build a, um, a uh, transparent wall. <laughs> I don't know. You know, there, uh, so like I said, I haven't formulated these thoughts well enough, but I, that's like my personal mission for our community yeah. is that on both sides, that doctors, can um, open their eyes to how to change the conversation, even in a seven minute visit where it's all about insurance and all about money. How can you still connect with someone and make them feel heard? Even if it's saying, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, under I understand that you're going through something difficult, 
and that you're, you're being honest with me, I don't have the answer. Maybe I can point you in the direction of someone. I'm really hoping this is, this is where Wellacopia and my business can also help. But beyond that, it's just how can both of us, the doctors and the patients, get on the same level, even though we come from very different or seemingly different backgrounds or points of reference? I don't think that's impossible at all. And the healthcare system could stay the same. It could change. In our country, it loves to change. So um, I think it, it might be the right idea for us to think about how can we make this better while ignoring what's going out, all the noise on the outside. Yeah. What can we do as patients and be recognized as people again? Hmm. So that was my little gospel right there. Um, no, it was good. It was very it was good, good gospel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just didn't think you made me feel like a little bit hopeful. I admit, like I, 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 there's hope in the idea of how can we foster conversations, not just within the chronic illness community, right? But and not just so that we increase awareness about us and our existence to you know people who are not chronically ill, but specifically across that bridge to the medical community as a back and forth where you're right. It's not, and I, I should say that I don't hate doctors, right? Like I don't even hate all of my doctors. <laughs> I've had doctors that are really compassionate people, but you're right the system is designed in a way that sometimes they're held back from being able to provide any level of care that's bigger than what they're already doing. That's it. They've already pushed the limits of what they're allowed to do. Uh, I love the idea of how can we target these conversations more specifically to build bridges between medical voices and those who are chronically ill and disabled, not just raise awareness, but say, okay, like, we're the two camps here that have to find solutions together. So what does that even look like? And I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sort of with you a little bit. I'm like, I don't actually know what that looks like. But I really, I don't know. It made me feel very hopeful, the idea of just even having those kinds of targeted conversations. What that could do is, is, is amazing. I so a limit on that. Yeah. And um, I am going to work more towards that. I mean, it's, it's part of, it was always part of my mission. Or I guess it was always my mission with Wellacopia. You know, we, we match people based on compatibility, not just diagnosis and medical degree or something like that. Yeah. But I want it to be more of a community than a matching platform. And I don't mean mat a community as in like a Facebook group kind of community. Right. A sense of this is a community where we're trying to find the right people to be partners with. Because we're actually a partner as, as well as them being our partner. It is a partnership. Um, it's also why I, I base it off of a dating site. It's built just like a dating site because we're just people. <laughs> it's a relationship. That's, that's what it's supposed to be. Um, and actually going back to uh, getting us sort of all in the same room, um, I actually did do that for, for kind of our, our launch. It was like a silent launch party of Wellacopia. I called it uh, the care fair that I actually did with um, um, Allie Cashel, who has chronic Lyme. Uh, she was also on the podcast about this. And uh, the care fair, it's a, I know it's like a little bit of a silly name, but it was about celebrating self-care on both sides. And it was an event with practitioners and patients. Ooh. And it was wonderful. It was really wonderful being open, like having these conversations um, from both sides with these people in a room. And it was a hundred people, like it was a decent size, but I want that to happen on a grand scale. And I want to mm -hmm. have more of these care fairs. And but it was just like our, our first test of how can we, how can we wrap all this up together? How can we get everyone literally in the same room having this conversation? And it was wonderful. It was mm -hmm. really wonderful. So I am glad that is instilled a little bit of hope. We can talk about it further and we'll like rally up in a different way. And um, there's already some people have been talking about this with pretty extensively. Uh, uh, this one woman who will be on the podcast, I'm going to mess this up, but she said something about regaining or per her, her persona. 
this is going to be really embarrassing giving that she will be on the podcast <laughs> later on, mm -hmm. but something about um, bringing back her identity as a person mm -hmm. and, and um, basically uh, demanding that of doctors, but in a nice way, like ask me how I'm doing. Let's have like a conversation. Even if it's a quick one, we're people, let's talk. Not just like, I see your chart says. <laughs> Yes, how are you today? <laughs> I think the other aspect that I'm most interested in these days is there are a lot of conversations happening around healthcare in the context of insurance and, and what that system looks like going forward. And, but it's difficult when we're not sort of centering voices of people who are chronically ill and disabled, right? Like there's so many people that just want to talk about healthcare insurance and, and how we get it politically in this country and what the system looks like going forward. And they're talking about the ideals of what that system should or shouldn't look like. And there are so many times I'm listening to the conversation and I'm like, I can see how all of that makes sense to you, but <laughs> like your impression of how the system even works right now and the kind of care that you get from your doctor has to do with the fact that you see your doctor in a very limited set of contexts, right? Like you go for very traditional, like I go for my well check and I, and I get my regular pap smear and I do this. And when you're someone that gets repeated ongoing care, when you need things that are a little more complex, the system looks very different. And so as much as it's very important, and I don't want to downplay how important that we continue to look at the best way to provide access to healthcare. I don't think we can have that conversation accurately or fairly unless we're willing to look at how people are experiencing the system that we have it right now. And what I mean is, for instance, like I am in many ways a huge proponent of uh, socialized medicine. I'm not going to lie. My, my husband's Canadian. So, you know, there, there's that. Oh yeah. Um, and so it's difficult for me sometimes to participate in conversations about things like Medicare for all, because uh, on the one hand, I want everybody to have healthcare and not have to pay an enormous premium right now. My insurance premium is almost comparable to my mortgage. It's, it's killing us. It's absolutely killing us. Um, I'm gonna get emotional. Like it's, I cannot tell you how many times we have thought we were going to lose our house or it's just, it kills us. And every year it goes up. So yeah, I, I'd like to see an end to that for sure. But I think the part we don't always notice or talk about is the idea of simply saying, okay, well then we're just going to get everybody on Medicare and that's going to fix that. You're all going to have free insurance tomorrow. Great. Try talking to some people who are disabled and chronically ill and are on Medicare right now. Because there are some very complex and there's some very diverse opinions on the quality of care that they're currently receiving. And if we're not willing to have real hard conversations about, okay, but what's not working about Medicare at the moment? It's easy to just compartmentalize this and say, well, as long as we got everybody access to health insurance now and they don't have to pay for it, the system's fixed. <laughs> Hooray. Not necessarily, no. Because as much as I want to lose my almost $2,000 a month insurance premium, if I'm brutally honest, the reason I'm paying that premium right now is because I chose an insurance company that is offering a quality of care that works for me. If you told me right now that tomorrow they were going to take away all the rules about income qualifications and anybody that wanted to get on Medicare could just ditch their insurance and go get on Medicare tomorrow, I'm going to be brutally honest. I wouldn't do it. Not necessarily. It would, it would be a very difficult decision. I'm not sure I would do that. But it's hard to have that conversation when it feels like sometimes we're not all working with the same terms. We're not all having the same conversation, if you will. And so when you start to bring up those criticisms, you hear, oh, so like you, you just want to keep going with private insurance. No, I'm not saying let's just keep the system we have. I'm saying if we don't start to not just occasionally bring in for diversity points a disabled or chronically ill person, if we don't start 
to center these voices who are, man, you want people that can give you an accurate representation of healthcare? How about we bring in the people that are interacting with their doctors on a darn near weekly basis, <laughs> who don't just see them once or twice a year to get some new vaccinations, but who really can bring together a more holistic approach of this is what it looks like to get care in this country. If we're not willing to do that first, I'm very scared that any change that happens in the system might inevitably put us even further off the mark for quality care for people like us. Because when we make a good change in some ways, I think it has the tendency to get people who aren't, I don't want to say recipients, but who aren't affected, right? Like the way we are, it can, it, when you're outside of it, it's easy to go, look, we did a good thing. So now we don't have to think about that anymore. Like we fixed it. Just give it time. We fixed it. You just don't get it yet. Like, trust me, it'll catch up to you. you you'll, you'll understand later that what we did was really, really good. Just hang out. And then we can all sit around and congratulate ourselves and think we fixed it for them. I'm scared that if we don't find a way to communicate the ways the system is failing us right now outside of just the cost of insurance, the actual quality of the care itself, that these proposed solutions might accidentally make things worse and people might not notice it because they're just going to be so excited about the access that they've provided for everybody else. And that's hard because again, I am a huge proponent. Like I want some kind of a Medicare for all system. I do but not as it exists right now, I don't. That's, that's not good enough. And I'm really afraid that if we don't start being more intentional in the way that we say that and point that out, if we don't start getting more vocal about it, all people are gonna hear is, well, you guys wanna make sure that you're not bankrupted by your insurance. Great, we gave you that, moving on. And that it'll, it's almost sort of a, like, if we're gonna change things and do this huge, enormous change, we need to get it all in there and get it right. You know what I mean? And not just change this one component. And then the conversation moves on to something else and we've missed the window to really holistically change the system. So if we're not, like I said, we're not centering the voices of the people that are gonna be using the care the most, I, I'm very concerned that we'll inevitably make it worse, even though it seems like a great way to make it better. Yeah, I, uh, I guess the conversations really around, as, as you said, access. So it is a lot of the country maybe doesn't have access financially, but then those who need it most are those that are you know, like us. And actually that's, I mean, regardless of um, financial stability or, yeah. or like instability. Um, I mean, I, I know that you alluded to, or at least being brought up in a family where you were very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and same with me. And it's like, I was, well, mine was awkward because I was brought up in a household where both my parents are in corporate America and getting healthier was not a problem. But then I was thrown into an awkward world where I was on Medicaid, um, because, uh, I was sick, wasn't able to, you know, really have uh, a career like I wanted. It turns out I wanted to be an entrepreneur anyway. So I was um, quote unquote out of work, even though I've been doing this for a long time. So I was eligible for Medicaid before I got married. And I was like, this is awesome because I can't afford healthcare. I also got very lucky in that I lived in an area in New York City where there happened to be a lot of doctors who took Medicaid. Um, but the, I think there was only one doctor I actually saw relatively often and I hated her <laughs> like and I and I did I felt like I didn't have a choice I did have a choice and there are options now that I wasn't aware of that even though more expensive I would have made work uh but yeah I kept thinking to myself like it's a good thing that I'm pretty stable right now mm. like I need this doctor but I'm I'm okay she's giving me the medication I need I'm finding other ways um to do like therapies that I need. Um, but I really had to craft it. And I felt so weird. I was like, I'm really, really lucky right now. I have access to this doctor and medication. I don't have to pay for it. I'm in, I'm in New York City, which makes me lucky on another level. Um, and yet I was, I was like, I deserve so much more. And I do. I am absolutely entitled to that. But then it's comparing to what other people are experiencing, right? Mm -hmm. 
it's just all so it's all so messed up it is i think absolutely. it's hard because sometimes it gets presented as like well which of these two crappy choices is is less crappy and like we improved things so aren't you grateful that we improved things because again do not get me wrong I am not okay with the solution being, well, if you wouldn't want to be on Medicare, then we're not going to do Medicare for all. We're going to just keep the current system and hopefully someday we'll get the price down. Like, that's, not a, that's not a solution to me here either. Like, I do want to find a way to get out of the insane system we are currently in. I do. I just want to make sure that we're not saying that's good enough then like that's it. That's the only goal is, well, now you don't pay for your insurance anymore. The end, like you go... Well, if anything, I think it's that sometimes people think that's what we're talking about. Uh, let me explain. Like, I think when you say something like Medicare for all, people are like, oh, so you'd have exactly the same care that you have right now. You just wouldn't pay for it anymore. And isn't that great? Not necessarily. Like, if that's what we're talking about, we need to be very clear that that's the specific goal here, that you could have the same care you're getting right now, but how do we drop out the insane $2,000 premium? Saying let's just institute Medicare for all tomorrow is actually a very different thing. It's saying let's put everybody on a system that currently exists right now that tells you these are the doctors that we cover, this is the care that we cover, this is the cost associated with that. And I am, again, a proponent of something like that plan. I am. And it's not going to sound like it because I wouldn't necessarily want to sign up for that tomorrow because. Access is the most important thing, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. Access matters, but there has to be a quality of care behind that access that's consistent. And as it exists right now, the quality of care isn't consistent across different insurance companies, across different tiers of your insurance plan. So if we're not being careful in the way that we frame these conversations, that gets missed by a lot of able-bodied folks who don't use their insurance very often, who don't visit their doctors very regularly, who think, oh, well, I might not see Dr. Jones anymore. I might get moved over here to this person, but that's not that big of a change to them. There are way bigger things to consider in quality of access than I have to drive an extra five minutes to this other doctor now. But you may not know that if you're not somebody who's consistently using their care. And so I can't stress enough that like, all I want to see is it's not enough to just sort of decide I'm either pro socialized medicine or I'm pro private medicine. And that's it. Like that's the conversation. That's not enough. It's not enough to let politicians sit around and debate this and talk about it or advocates even. It doesn't make sense. And it's not a complete conversation unless chronic illness and disabled voices are there to help form whatever this new system is and what it looks like going forward. Because at the end of the day, we're just going to see things that you might not even notice or know about or know are an issue. If we're not there in the planning stages, I just see so many ways that this could go south. So many ways that well-meaning advocates have a tendency to think, oh, if I was chronically ill, I would want this, that, the other way. You don't, you don't know. You don't know what it's like until you're here. And you don't know which needs in your care, like if you sat down with your insurance providers, like the forms they send out each year for your plan and they're like, this is what we cover and these are what the costs are. And I think many folks don't even really look at all of that beyond what's my basic like copay or what's my basic percentage of for a normal visit. I go through those every year with a fine tooth comb because I have to look at certain tests, certain lab things, certain stays and say, if if these sort of lower down the paper things have dramatically changed in what cost comes on me as compared to my doctor, other people may not notice. I notice. I will actually have to choose a different plan if certain things shift, certain things that other people might not even ever need from their insurance company. It's stuff like this that we have to start considering. It's not just enough to say, we want everyone to have access to insurance. Sure, we all agree on that. We do. But what kind of care are they going to get with that insurance? Because unless we're answering that question and doing it in specific detail, I, 
like I said, I'm somebody who's desperate to get rid of my premium. It's killing my family. It's killing my family. I would do just about anything to get rid of it tomorrow. And yet I know, like I said, if they say, great, we'll put you on Medicare right now tomorrow, I can't promise you I would do that. I'm actually really hesitant to even lean more towards doing it than not. That's how serious it is to get to part B of this conversation, which is what's the quality of care behind that access. And if it means everybody has to take a giant step down in order to get rid of the insurance premium, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That may work for, you know, your typical healthy American. That's not going to work for people who are dependent on that care every single day of their lives. It's not. That's not going to be good enough for us. And, and any sort of plan that's like, well, let's, let's tackle the big stuff first. <laughs> let's get the access thing taken care of, and then we'll give it some time to work the kinks out of the system. And then as these things come up, we'll address them in subsequent bills. And again, for people who would depend on that care every single day, that's not going to work. Like there is no breaking in period where I can afford to have crappy care for six months and just hope that it all works out in the end. There are people who, you know, are dependent on medications to save their life that can't go, oh, well, until they come up with some sort of like Medicare Part B type thing again, I'll just figure it, that we can't do that. Like if we're going to make a dramatic change, we have to get it right from the beginning and not, oh, well, that's sort of a subsequent conversation. We can figure out those details later. As long as everyone gets insurance, that's the most important thing. It's just not good enough. It's not. The quality of care matters here. And I don't know how to help reframe some of those conversations without sounding like I don't want Medicare for all. You know what I mean? Like as soon as you go down this road, it's like, well, you don't sound very supportive of socialized medicine. You sound like you like your insurance company a whole lot, Stephanie. I don't. I don't have any special affection for Kaiser. Right now, they're the lesser of all the evils for me. Yay for them. Like, that's not a high bar. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to stay with them because I love them, but I also don't want to lose the quality of care that I've become accustomed to. And I don't know how to find that balance in this conversation of, yes, I want to lose my premium, but not if it means the quality of my care has to tank in order for me to do it. And then on top of it all, if you want to go out of the system altogether, which in, in many respects, in respect, might be the best thing to do, we don't know enough about what's right for us in mm. that environment either. Because I'm, I'm very pro all, all kinds of care, all legitimate kinds of care. And, uh, but we, we still go in in the dark, right? You said in the Wild West. Yeah. Wild West is a great place to be, but it can also be very scary. Don't um, get me wrong. I said like sniffing oils and Magnus, all this stuff. But in reality, like if you could see behind this sound booth, I have an entire wall of essential oils behind the sound booth, right? Like I'm not anti yeah. holistic care. I just know that there are a lot of really unfortunate quacks that are out there that are preying on people like us who don't necessarily get the care they need from the mainstream medical community. And they see dollar signs attached to that right away. Because if there's no way to be a hundred percent sure that something is legit, that just opens the door for so many people to be like, just, just trust me on this. Western medicine doesn't want you to know about my magic water because it would just, man, the pharmaceutical companies would hate it if you learned about my magic water. So please buy my magic water and it will cure you. There's so much of that out there. So I hope I didn't come off like only Western medicine has the answers and everything else is quackery. Like it's just a tough balance of, there is a lot of quackery out there. It's hard. Mm -hmm. They target us. It's hard. It's it. Yeah. It's hard is uh, the poster yeah. for this, uh, for our lives. Um, but I want to, while I very much enjoy is not really the right word. Um, but I am comforted by conversations like this, uh, because it shows we can pinpoint what are the real issues. And it's also good to relate to one another. I am a positive person and I try <laughs> in every, in, in every chance possible um, to think, well, what, what can we do? Yeah. Even if it's weedy, weedy, tiny, even if it's just ourselves, what can we do maybe in our little communities? 
Um, this is where social media, I think, is great. You know, mm. social media is also one of those things you can love hate social media, but it does bring a lot of us together. Mm-hmm. Um, like, what can we do right now? And based on what we were talking about before, and also some, I'll just actually say based on something else you said. Um, we were talking. You were talking about um, like rallying the disabled voices, mm-hmm. um, which I obviously agree with, but. yelling at another party works to an extent and it can but it's it's hostile Hmm. it's um it's going at change from a negative angle and look i'm not trying to be all hugs and butterflies and whatever that's a (laughs) weird way to say that um (laughs) but (laughs) you know what i'm saying like i knew what you meant yeah yeah, it's um rainbows and butterflies. Is that what people say? It's not it's not fluffy. It's not you know, fluffy. saying it all has to be fluffy. It's not all has to be fluffy, but again, it's like when you're yelling at someone, what's someone's first reaction is they're gonna yell back. And doctors mm-hmm. and um even politicians and all the other people involved in healthcare, they have they have things that they could yell back at us, like as we just said we're giving you access to care. Come on. Like that was really hard for us to do. And look, they have, they have valid reasons for doing what they do and saying what they have to say. Look, we can say good and bad on both sides. And so when I think about how do we move forward while we absolutely need to speak up, no doubt about that. It's like, how how should we be speaking up? Mm. We can, um, and in a way that we're heard right? That, that there's not an immediate defense to, well, that was nutty and aggressive and wow, like I'm not interested in hearing any more of that. How do we speak in a way that fosters like an ongoing conversation? Yeah. yeah. This is actually, I mean, this is a relationship too of, of like two parties having a relationship rather than like, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And I'm just now thinking in terms of philosophy of like life and all relationships. <laughs> I could, there's a bajillion analogies for this too, but that's, look, that's my opinion. And maybe it's a bit too optimistic, but I might, I, my feeling is always go towards the most optimistic, most positive thing. Maybe Mm. it won't be that, but if you're working in that direction, then maybe you'll get close. You're on the way. Um, I don't think you should be in any way embarrassed of like that optimism because I do think the hardest part when you're doing activism work is, is that propensity towards cynicism, right? That it, it almost becomes just one big trauma bonding club. Like let's all just sit and rehash the horrible things that have happened to us. And, and because of the way the brain works, right? The more you retell that trauma, the more your brain actually just replays it and the more inflamed that gets for you. And more than that, if you're an empath or you're an empathetic person, then you listen to someone else's trauma and you take that on and then you're angry and more upset. And so there is a propensity in activism towards cynicism, towards this all sucks. It's terrible. We're all going to talk about how terrible it is. End of meeting. The end. Like, that's it. It's really hard to find that balance. And we need voices like yours that say, yes, this is wrong, but where can we go from here? What would a positive change look like? Because it's not enough to say, we need change, we need change. Like, if we're not volunteering some kind of vision of where to go, like we're just going to keep aimlessly hopping from new system to new system to new system, and every one of them is going to have problems because we didn't think this plan through. If we're not willing to like, carve out that intentional space for hope, and for some form of optimism, whatever that looks like for us, we're not going in any direction. We're just sitting around reliving the same trauma over and over again. So I don't, like, I don't think you should be embarrassed or like feel like, oh, maybe I'm too optimistic or like, oh, maybe that's too cutesy. And like, I think we need more people like that. I think it's easy to get sucked down the cynicism hole and just focus on everything that's wrong with the system Again, don't get me wrong. I am not saying let's tone police everything and make it so that it's just really comfortable for the pharmaceutical companies and doctors to hear us better. Like, I get it. There are problems. Raise your voice. 
be out there. You can, you know, be an activist on the front line saying this is not okay. There's absolutely space for that. I just love that you're trying to find that balance of how do we recognize those voices and still say, where could we go? How could we do this better? What does it look like to cooperatively come up with solutions instead of just burning it all down? Where do we go from here? What does it look like? I, I for one, appreciate that you can do that. I have a hard time. Sometimes I, I feel pulled more towards the cynicism side. It's hard to remember that the goal here is better care, right? It's not just that we make these people pay the price. It's not just we get them to acknowledge what they've done to us. Like These are not the goals. <laughs> the goal is better care. The goal is that people's needs are met. The goal is that everybody comes out of this happier and healthier and more holistically, you know, I don't know good word for that. It's just, I appreciate that you keep the focus on forward and not just how crappy things are that are behind us. I don't re believe in regret. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in reflection. Uh, you know, I've even done a lot of things in my life that I am not happy about. Um, I do not regret them. I just think to myself, well, what, what can be done now? And I, I try to think about that outside of myself too. What, mm -hmm. what can be done now? And overall, I just think about I really do think it's good to take yourself um, as an example or even just individuals as an example and then project what that would look like on a grand scale. Hmm. So I think to myself when something's not going well in a relationship that I'm having, like there is a disconnect. We are not seeing eye to eye and there's just no way to get past it. You got to take a step back and actually sit, look at that other person and you know, it's the look at, uh, what is it? Um, take a walk in their shoes. That's one way to look at it. But just they're human, just like I'm human, doctors and patients, they are human. That's a human that is having, having human feelings right now, human experiences. How can I relate to them? I might not be a doctor. I might not know the rules. I might not know the money situation, whatever. But they're trying to, let's just say there's a doctor here that is trying to do the best they can in this scenario. Yeah. They're trying to do the best they can. And I do know a lot of doctors um, that I can see doing that. I'm like, maybe you're doing the best you can. And I don't think you're doing it the right way, <laughs> but you're trying like they, their yeah. intentions are good. And other than like sociopaths, most people's intentions are good. Again, rose colored glasses here, but really like at, <laughs> human humans are human. We are just human and all of the, those, even those assholes out there in the White House and stuff, it, we're all, we're all, look, I don't really want to give them any credit, but we're all human. Yeah. So I really can't say that enough. And I hope that um, that resonates with you and other people listening that anytime you have trouble getting through to any person, just remember that they're human, you're human, and connecting, knowing that both of you are human is a great place to start. I think that's why it's so powerful when you have shows like this, where you bring people on to predominantly to share their story, right? Because if there's anything that humanizes these conversations and reminds us that this is not just some political debate, this is not a bunch of people having a broad philosophical conversation about systems of government and how we deliver insurance. Like, these are human people with really diverse stories. And part of the kind of like, because I typically write theology more than anything else, I don't have a seminary background, right? Like I didn't go to seminary and, and get the degree that's typically associated with doing this work. And there are a lot of people like me who did it. Because what we found is that the most powerful way to communicate to people what this has to do with us, 
Like why, why even sit around and have conversations about how we think God is or who we think God is or what we think he's like? It's all pointless unless we're relating this to what this has to do with us as people, right? How do we treat each other? What do we owe our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Uh, for people from a Christian tradition, it's this idea of, I carry the image of God in me and you carry the image of God in you. And no matter how upset I get with you or what you might say or what you might do, we both carry that image of God. And that means that we each deserve a certain amount of respect from the other person and a certain amount of admiration for that image of God. I love that shows like this are so good at pointing back to that same humanity, right? Of each one of these stories is a person who's experiencing this in a very real and tangible human way. This is not a hypothetical. This is not a big picture debate. This is a person who's dealt with illness, who's dealt with the system. And what has that looked like for them? I wish we could do more of this. I wish we could find a way to take this and apply it to so many more contexts. I wish, I, I don't necessarily want to watch a news program that's all just human interest, like fluff stories as they do it now, but you know what I mean? Like, I wish we could find a way to really see the humanity or for people from that Christian context to see the image of God in people and say, that's really special and valuable and important. And I want to respect and honor that rather than just sort of throw a bunch of random facts at people and turn these people, our neighbors, each other, into debate fodder, right? We're just anecdotal evidence in a debate to further prove my point of whatever I was already going to say to begin with, regardless of whatever you said. I had just already decided this is who was, how it was going to be, and this is what I think, and I'm just going to grab the right stories that sort of feed into that I wish we could find a way to do more of this, to have people just sit down and say, I don't necessarily have an agenda. I don't know where this conversation's going to go. Maybe we'll go on a 20 minute tangent about ballet. Who knows? But we're just going to share stories because the more we learn about other people, like the more we realize how much we owe each other and how interconnected we are and how much we belong to each other. And it's not enough to just hope and pray that everything works out well, you, you get invested, right? In your neighbors, you start to see their humanity. You start to see that image of God and say, I need to take care of that. I need to protect and honor that. Like, how do I help give you the best life possible? Not just me, not just my, my kids, my household, my immediate, how do I make sure that you and you and you and you over there, how do all of us as a community have the best quality of life possible? How can we really belong to each other? So I think you've made something amazing here. I love what you're doing. And I wish we could do more of this in more contexts. I think it's important. We can. <sighs> there you are with your hopeful optimism again. What are you doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those days that I was feeling pretty drained too. Um, woo. <laughs> well, I... I, we could clearly keep talking forever and ever. Um, but I'm very quiet. I don't like to talk. <laughs> I'm an introvert, very shy. Yeah, we're not looking. Not super opinionated. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. And we didn't even really cover a lot of things I wanted to cover. Um, I'm sorry. So we got, um, but uh, uh, I will be letting everyone know about what you've accomplished and what you've turned all of what you've been talking about into to promote a, a better, a better world for us. Hmm. Really? I know that's overall sounds grand because that's what it is. You have become a, a monumental component of what we're trying to do. Everything that we're talking about, you are an optimistic. I'm trying. It doesn't come naturally to me anymore. I think it used to. I think that's a component of trauma brain, right? When, when you have PTSD, it's, it's not just being triggered by the, like, the specific bad things that have happened to you. It's this overall feeling of the constant sensation of waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? 
because when you've had enough horrific things happen to you, your brain starts to go, well, that's what we should expect. So we should look for danger around every single corner. I think over time, optimism has just gotten a lot harder for me. So it's really makes me a little bit emotional, you would say, like that you still see it there and that you still see it in my work because I'm trying. Like that's a very intentional choice to try to cultivate. In fact, like small tangent, but when I wrote my book, I turned in an outline. When you write nonfiction, you don't write the whole book ahead of time, right? You sell them a proposal. It's just an outline of what the book could be. And then you write it with their guidance. And so I sold them an eight chapter outline and it was very, I'm going to rebuke these horrible prosperity gospel ideas in the world. You can pray your illnesses away and this, and we're going to, we're going to do this better. We're going to talk about grief and suffering and pain. And we're going to have a really healthy conversation about those things. And I got to the end of writing and I went, it needs one more chapter. And so I added a ninth chapter and they let me keep it. And the whole chapter is just on, but how do we balance all of this with this idea of hope? Where is there room for hope in all of this in the end? Because if I just sell another book that claims I have all the answers for why bad things happen in the world, and instead of having it all be, it's all part of a grand plan, I swing to the other side of cynicism and say, because it's all horrible, I have not done anybody any favors. I haven't helped. I just polarized the conversation even further. And so I wrote an entire chapter that was basically just very personal stories of me trying to walk this out right now. and. It's like the most convoluted chapter of here's a story of me at a church service where people are going up and praying for healing. And I'm like, this is garbage. That's not a thing. And I go up and I ask for healing and I don't get it. And it's this crazy story of like, why would you even tell us that? That because it's important that we keep fighting for some shred of hope, because if we've already let go of that, what are we even fighting for anymore, right? Like you could give me the best quality of care tomorrow, but if I haven't held on to reasons why this life is worth living, then why am I fighting so hard to save my life? Why? If I can't find joy and purpose and hope in my life right now, as it exists, as a chronically ill and disabled person, if I can't find reasons to live now, we are kidding ourselves if we think those are all suddenly going to appear when everything works out right? If I got a cure tomorrow and I was just miraculously healed, it's delusional to think that I would suddenly develop practices of joy or hope because everything's going right in my life. That's not how it works. I, I think it's great that you consistently keep pointing your conversations back to, and it, it's hope. It's not optimism to me. It's, it's hope. It's that's worth fighting for. Hope has teeth, right? Like optimism sounds so fluffy and hope is, man, it's not unicorns and rainbows or like cute mantras on a pillow. Hope has teeth. Hope is like, we have lost the last 14 battles in a row and we are bloody and we are wounded and we are showing up again anyways, because who knows, maybe we will win this time. Let's see. I, you are like such a hopeful person and I appreciate that. And I'm trying to cultivate that. I am. It's just like we said 80,000 times. It's hard. It's hard to do. I am definitely going to change uh, the words I use and I'm going to change it to hope rather than optimism. I love this hmm. hope has teeth thing. I, I like, I'm going to make a drawing later. <laughs> hope All right. Um, we do have to wrap up, but yep. man, <laughs> I that's feel- not at all how either of us saw this going. No. <laughs> I want to. Like, we're both like be- wiped out. We're both like no spoons days. We both were like, I don't even know. My brain's not functional, so we'll just see what happens. That was not what I was expecting to come out. I have a lot of spoons now. <laughs> <sighs> I don't, so I'm gonna go watch TV because that just. Woo. It's like different kind of spoons. It's like, I want to go lay and not do anything, but I also feel like energized. I feel that hope. Hmm. I feel talking to you, it, it, it really, I'm, I'm all jazz. I'm going to do jazz fingers right now. <laughs> not ballet fingers, jazz fingers. <laughs> oh, scary. These are, uh, sorry. If anyone gets there. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Like it means a lot to me. I love the work you're doing. I think it's really important. Please keep it up. Please keep it up. Thanks, Stephanie. And you, you as well. Absolutely. An enormous pleasure. (sighs) 
Thanks for listening to another episode of the Invisible Not Broken podcast. If you haven't already, please take the next 30 seconds to do these two things. Subscribe to our episodes and share this episode with a Spoonie friend. This episode was brought to you by Wellacopia, the matching site that helps you find your ideal practitioners for your individual needs. Join the movement to help chronic illness warriors like you, like us, match with the right care. Getting the right care when faced with a chronic illness can be one of the most challenging things you may ever do in your life. It's hard to know who to trust and dealing with the providers who don't understand or even believe what you're going through can make you feel frustrated, defeated, and even broken. I don't believe it has to be this way. I started Wellacopia because I was suffering too. And knowing the reality that it takes an average of 10 years for an accurate diagnosis really pissed me off. That's 10 years of suffering, 10 years of doubting, 10 years of missing out on a full life. We built Wellacopia to match people with practitioners who are best for them, not just as patients, but as people, because the patient practitioner relationship is a human relationship. Matching with the right doctor should be treated with just as much care as matching with the right life partner. We've only been live for a few months and already we've been people matching with We've already been lit We've only been live for a few months and already we have people seeking matches in 42 states and 5 countries. But this mission and momentum can't continue without your help. In order to bring on enough practitioners to support Wellacopia's growth around the country and the world, we need you to refer amazing medical and wellness practitioners you love and trust so that others can benefit from them like you have. Thousands of you are listening to this. If each of you recommend just one practitioner, hundreds of thousands of chronic illness warriors like you will benefit. You may even be saving someone's life. If you don't have a health professional to recommend, you can still help us help you. The more people we have on Wellacopia, the faster the community grows and the better the matches will be. Joining takes just two minutes, it's free, and whether you recommend a practitioner or not, just by signing up, you are making a difference in the future of healthcare. Join our mission to humanize healthcare. Go to wellacopia.com today. Thank you to those of you who have already joined. If you have any questions or feedback or want to partner with Wellacopia's mission in any way, feel free to send me an email at eva at wellacopia.com. Until next time, be kind, be gentle, be badass.